Hello everyone, it's Wednesday and you're watching Within the Frame. I'm Kim bo -kyung. North Korea is going to retry launching a military reconnaissance satellite sometime between Thursday and the last day of August. Now, such a launch window overlaps with the annual Ulti Freedom Shield exercise between South Korea and the U.S. and is not long after the trilateral summit between Seoul, Washington and Tokyo. The regime's leader has also reportedly inspected a soaring strategic cruise missile being launched from a small vessel. What can be said about the timing of North Korea's such moves? What are other North Korean issues that should be looked at? For this, we invite Dr. Ko Myung-hyun, senior fellow at the Asan Institute for Policy Studies. Dr. Go, welcome to the show. Good to be here. And we also have Mikhail Huheven, a Dutch member of the European Parliament. Mr. Huheven has been studying North Korea and made three visits there between 2014 and 2017. Good to see you, Mr. Huheven. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being with us. Now, Dr. Go, first question mm -hmm. to you. Uh, North Korea has notified Japan of its plan to launch mm -hmm. military reconnaissance satellite between this Thursday and the last day mm -hmm. of August. Now, what can we say about the timing? Well, so there are multiple layers to North Korean actions usually, and then we know that uh, this is taking place uh, amidst the, the trilateral meeting in Camp David, as well as the ongoing, uh, the, you know, the, actually study this week, the joint military drills uh, between United States and South Korea, the Ulchi Freedom Shield. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, one of the, I mean, the timing, the, one of the reasons why North Korea has chosen this particular timing mm -hmm. is probably because of the, the September 9th, the, 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 the the, the day that celebrates the foundation of North Korea. Mm. Uh, it's an important event uh, for North Korea as usual, and they are likely to hold a parade. Mm. Uh, and also, North Korea needs to celebrate. And I think they need uh, a lot of reasons for celebration right now because uh, North Korea is in an economic crisis, and um, clearly Kim Jong-un is not very happy with the uh, with the, the progress being made or lack of thereof in the economic front as well as the military front. Mm. And we know that the North Korea uh, tried uh, the testing uh, this space vehicle called, called the Chonima 1 uh, last May. Mm. So it's, al it's almost exactly three months ago that North Korea tried to launch Chonima and then but they failed. So I think uh, they need to uh, make up for it. Mm. And so if they can somehow succeed this time, then it's going to be take place on the eve of the uh, September 9th uh, anniversary of the State Foundation Day. And then uh, Kim Jong-un's face will be saved and then they will be able to have a reason to celebrate. Mm, right, I see. So it's mm. because of the day of celebrating the foundation of North Korea. Uh, Dr. Go, before the mm. warning, uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, he uh, visited the uh, mm. Navy unit and mm. he has reportedly inspected the strategic mi mm. cruise missile test, mm. right? But South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff pointed out that it is it's not a strategic cruise missile, but rather a short-range anti-ship missile. Mm. What are the difference between the, these two? Well, the, with the so-called strategic cruise missile, uh, uh, is that I mean the the, the, uh, the attribute that determines whether a cruise missile is strategic or not mm -hmm. is a range. Range. So the North Korea has claimed that the so-called Arrow 2, the strategic uh, cruise missile, has flown 2,000 kilometers mm -hmm. uh, for two hours, I believe, and uh, making a figure eight over the East Sea. Uh, so this is a pattern of uh, 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 cruise, uh, autonomous cruise missile that the other countries have also developed. Mm -hmm. So because of the range, North Korea has claimed that uh, you know, it's a strategic uh, cruise missile. Uh, but then on the other hand, the anti-ship cruise missile has a much shorter range, mm -hmm. usually about 200 kilometers or so. And uh, it's a much uh, more, more about uh, established technology. It's been around for decades, and North Korea has its, its possession hundreds of them. Mm. So, it's, uh, so that's the reason why I think uh, there's a key difference uh, between claiming success of mm -hmm. a strategic cruise missile, which North Korea is currently developing, and launching an anti-ship missile, which has been developed a long time ago. Mm. So if uh, what North Koreans are claiming is true, then it will, it will mark a major milestone in North Korea's weapons development roadmap. Uh, but then it clearly, I mean, there are indications that the North Koreans are probably faking this claim. Mm. Uh, because again, I think it uh, has to do with the timing uh, of the September 9th. Mm. It's the eve of the September 9th uh, uh, State Foundation Day. And North Korea has to have uh, many reasons to celebrate, which, which is lacking right now. Right, I see. Oh, now, Mr. Huhebin, the JCS also pointed out that they believe the missile failed to hit its target, while Pyongyang said it rapidly hit the target without any error. Now, if the GCS is correct, why is North Korea making such an exaggeration? 
I always call North Korea the nuclear streaker or nuclear ex exhibitionist, so to say. Uh, while many countries that have secretly pursued nuclear weapons or ballistic missiles have remained quite secretive about it. And North Korea is always very open and showing off to the world. Now, why is that? That is because they want to be perceived by the world as this erratic and dangerous regime, ready to push the button for nuclear war and being able to hit any uh, target they want anywhere in the world, especially the US mainland, of course. Uh, they believe it gives them leverage, it gives them credibility on the world stage. Uh, and more importantly, they believe that the world is scared of them. Um, so for the North Korean government, it's in their interest to have an, uh, as much credibly dangerous deterrent as possible. And that is why they exaggerate and that is why they continue to showboat their nuclear and ballistic missiles program. Mm -hmm. Right, I see. Now, uh, Dr. Go, so one of the main reasons uh, for North Korea's such mm. move was, like you said, because of the September 9th, the mm. day of the celebration of the Foundation Day, but mm. also the Ulji Freedom Shield mm. between South Korea and the U.S. could also be the reason, right? So what are the noticeable points of this year's exercise? So there are, there, I mean, so one of the major uh, difference between this year's so, uh, Ulji Freedom Shield and last year's is the size. Uh, there are more exercise components this time around, and also there are more uh, you know, other like the allied countries uh, sending observers and uh, more about in the nominal participation in the exercises. But in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, qualitative uh, aspects of the, the exercise, there are addition of uh, two major exercise components this year. Uh, one is the participation of the U.S. Space Force. Mm. Uh, there's a detachment of the U.S. Space Force called the U.S. Space Force Korea, and they are. I mean, it's there. They've been uh, around uh, for a while in South Korea, uh, you know, uh, working jointly with the USFK and also with the South Korean forces. But then, uh, this is the first time that the USFK and South Korea are making very clear that uh, the Space Force has a notab notable role in the joint military drills, mm -hmm. and it makes total sort of sense because uh, uh, clearly, after the, the Washington Declaration uh, earlier this year. Uh, there's been a change of a tone uh, in terms of uh, characterizing the joint military drills between South Korea and the United States. Mm -hmm. If uh, previously the joint military drills was more about deterring North Korea in the conventional mm -hmm. sense, uh, meaning like a non-nuclear aspect mm -hmm. of North Korean threat, uh, ever since the Biden administration and the South Korean uh, President Yoon Suk Yeol uh, agreed to uh, change, uh, essentially focus more on the nuclear missile threat from North Korea, mm -hmm. uh, there's been more hi more highlight given to the deterrence aspect uh, of uh, joint military drills focused on the missiles and nuclear front. Mm. And the reason why the Space Force is very important is because uh, the most important uh, component of the deter nuclear deterrence against North Korea is not the nuclear weapons per se, it's the, the ability to surveil and then and then uh, follow and detect and then uh, track North Korean missiles. Mm. And those sensors are mostly based on space. Mm. That's the reason why the Space Force role in defending South Korea is very important. So I think uh, uh, the, uh, the United States and South Korea want to highlight this aspect and then send a message to Pyongyang about it. Mm. Uh, another component that's very uh, that's new to this year's Ulchisha Freedom Shield is the uh, exercise to, uh, to uh, prevent the spread of misinformation or disinformation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's this fear that uh, if there's a contingency breaking out uh, in the Korean Peninsula, North Korea might um, make, make use of this information to solve confusion mm -hmm. and as well as uh, 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 essentially uh, uh, rattle the public opinion, uh, therefore like, uh, multiplying the, the threatening aspect of uh, North Korean uh, uh, capabilities. So the information aspect is very important in this year's uh, uh, joint military drills. Right, so we could say the exercise has become much more comprehensive. Exactly. Right, I see. Now, uh, Mr. Huevin, let's tap on to agreements made during the Camp Davis trilateral summit as well. The three countries decided not only to cooperate in conventional security areas, such as having annual joint military exercises, but also to, uh, they agreed to collectively address illegal cyber activities by North Korea and enhance cooperation on human rights issues. What does such extensive cooperation mean? 
Until now, uh, Japan and South Korea working together on even basic cooperation would have been quite difficult, mainly because of uh, historical disputes and irritants. Uh, but now seeing them working so closely together, uh, so extensively, the Camp David summit really showed that the world is moving towards what I call this blockization of geopolitics, where countries are more and more forced to align their strategic interests. Only a few years ago, we saw a policy of rapprochement from South Korea and the United States towards North Korea. We saw a policy of nuclear uh, containment. But after these talks collapsed, after the war in Ukraine, after we seeing um, the relations between the United States and China deteriorate, we now see that North Korea is investing more and more in their relations with the uh, People's Rep Republic of China and the Russian Federation. Mm. On the other hand, we see South Korea and Japan moving ever more closer, not only uh, with their relations towards the United States, but also with their, but also in order to secure their own geopolitical interest in the Indo-Pacific region. So when it comes to North Korea, um, it doesn't really surprise me that the, the South Korea and Japan are working much more closely together on what they consider to be their biggest immediate threat in the region. Mm, right, I see your point. Now, uh, Dr. Go, another noticeable part of the Camp David Trilateral Summit was the document on commitment to consult. Now, how did you see this document and will it be able to play a strong role in deterring North Korea? So the commitment to concert wasn't the only document issued at the Camp David summit. Uh, there are two others, uh, mm -hmm. probably more lengthier and more important mm -hmm. ones, but just uh, the spirit of the Camp right. David, also the principles of Camp David. Right. And, this, and then the, the recurring theme or like a phrase that occurs over and over across these three documents happens to be the commitment to concert among the three countries, mm -hmm. Korea, Japan, and the United States. So the commit commitment to concert in this case, the concerting parties, in fact, concerting uh, three countries are essentially promising to concert with each other uh, in case of a threat, mm -hmm. uh, contingencies, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, Security-wise, uh, mm -hmm. you know, emergencies in the in the region, uh, and then so in a way, there's uh, there's uh, I would say uh, duty or so to say obligation on the part of uh, the three countries. Uh, but then this is talking about we're uh, talking about concerting about uh, security situation rather than uh, concerting, no, like a, a, a joining forces together to mm. deter militarily against the threat. Mm. So this can can be seen as a very confusing part of the. Uh, the agreement that reached the Camp David, but then this, in fact, is a very common uh, component of any mutual defense treaty. Mm. So you can, uh, when you look at the mutual defense treaty between South Korea and the United States, between United States and Japan, as well as in NATO, uh, collective uh, security architecture, uh, there's a commitment to concert in, in each one of these treaties. Mm. So this essentially marks a policy discussion obligation uh, among the members, um, among the sign, signat uh, signatories of the uh, mutual defense treaty, essentially obliging these countries to recognize if there's a threat to uh, any of the you know, allies or partners. So this is a lower level security commitment, so mm. to speak. Uh, but then what's interesting about the, the, the separate document called the Commitment to Concert is that it's a shorter document compared mm -hmm. to two other documents, right. the Principles of Camp David, as well as the Spirit of Camp David. And what it does is clarifies the scope of this obligation to concert. Uh, there's no way they have to issue, the three countries have to jointly issue this separate document was because there are some concerns that uh, this Commitment to Concert could be construed or perceived by other countries in the region, especially by China. This is the beginning of a trilateral military alliance, mm, mm. similar to the one that you see uh, in Europe uh, mm. in the form of NATO. Mm. Uh, and then China has been very critical of such efforts by the United States and other countries in the region. So this separate document, com com uh, Commitment to Concert, clarifies what this uh, Commitment to Concert uh, entails. Mm. It limits the scope, basically, says that this is not a substitute or, or like a, or, or so something analog, analogous to a treaty. So essentially, there's no obligation mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, the, in the sense that the mutual defense treaty assigns to the signatories. So meaning that there's no automatic obligation to concern mm -hmm. about security contingency, but there's a political obligation, so to political speak. Obligation. So it's a, it's, a, it's a political obligation. So it means that as long as the three countries have a uh, like-minded uh, approach towards a security situation, uh, then there will be a natural uh, opportunity to concert about this issue. 
But if uh, there's a, a much more sensitive uh, situation for some reason, and then, then the, uh, any one of these countries can, you know, in fact, uh, hypothetically speaking, turn down uh, essentially uh, the other country's request to concert. Mm. So it's a lower level of obligation than a treaty obligation. So this is, uh, in a way, more of a message to, to China and then by extension to North Korea that mm. uh, this capital agreement is not in, it has not been put in place, uh, you know, targeting these countries in mind. So this is uh, it's purely about uh, joint security cooperation. Then would it be difficult to say that this uh, 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 commitment to consult has the aroma of alliance? Well, it is an alliance, uh -huh. but then what, uh, what this document is saying that it's a low-level alliance. Mm -hmm. This is not a, not, a, not a specific military alliance targeting a specific country in this mm -hmm. case. Mm -hmm. Right, I see. Now, uh, Mr. Huevin, with the three countries' ties having become stronger than ever before, what do you expect North Korea's next diplomatic move to be? Well, from the North Korean perspective, seeing South Korea, Japan, and the United States so closely aligned and more confrontational towards them, at least that's their perception, ironically, that is a gift from the heavens for them. They can now legitimize nationally and internationally that going nuclear was the right choice for them to secure their interests. So what North Korea will do now, first, they will continue to invest in their nuclear and missile deterrent. They will not give up their nuclear weapons. They will not denuclearize and they will not negotiate over this. Second, they will let their people know that the economy is bad, uh, but more hardships are coming because of the United States and South Korea and Japan's confrontational standing towards them. And they have already done this in their uh, press statements that they're now stating that we are ever more closer to a thermonuclear war. Uh, and they, uh, so they will continue to ramp up this rhetoric. And lastly, I think they will move more closely to the People's Republic of China and the Russian Federation in order to secure their uh, geostrategic interests, but also their economic lifeline. Mm, right, I see. So, Mr. Huevin, so North Korea resuming flights to Beijing and uh, having high expectations that uh, the travel, overland travel, is going to return to normal. Those could be uh, kind of measures to bolster ties with China, right? Yes, exactly. Mm. That's what we're seeing right now. Um, mm. the, the country has been closed off since COVID-19. They're gradually opening up, but they're opening up for what they consider uh, the right allies. Mm, right, I see. Now, uh, Dr. Go, moving on to the recent police report, a state-backed North Korean hacking group, mm. uh, Kim Suki, ki uh, was found to have carried out cyber attacks targeting the combined military drills. First of all, what is this group? So Kim Suki ki is one of the best-known North Korean state-sponsored hacking group. Mm -hmm. so the other one is Lazarus. Uh, mm -hmm. Lazarus has been behind uh, many of the heist against uh, cryptocurrency exchanges and digital wallets. Mm -hmm. uh, but then Kim Suki is just as old as Lazarus. Uh, the first instance that Kim Suki showed up in the experts radar, uh, the, the experts on uh, cybersecurity uh, have found about Kim Suki's activities it has been 12, 2012, mm. which more than 10 years since Kim Suki started its activities. Mm. Uh, both Kim Suki and Lazarus belong to uh, the uh, reconnaissance general bureau, which mm -hmm. is uh, uh, it's a uh, special uh, reconnaissance intelligence bureau of the North Korean military. And then, even though we call them Kim Suki and Lazarus, clearly in North Korea they are not known as they are mm -hmm. not known as Kim mm -hmm. Suki and Lazarus. These are terms of convenience assigned by the cybersecurity experts. And the reason why we call them Kim Suki is kind of interesting because uh, the one of uh, one of the earlier campaigns conducted by Kim Suki, Kim Suki used an email address called Kim Suk Gyang, mm -hmm. which is spelled uh, Kim. Su uh, key plus A and G, uh -huh. and then uh, the foreign experts were looking into this uh, uh, email address. They said to name this particular group Kim Suk Ki, a shorthand for Kim Suk Yang. Uh -huh. So it's a term of convenience, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, unlike Lazarus, though, uh, Kim Suk Ki has evolved. I uh, know, uh, really evolved. Actually, maintained the original mission of a state-sponsored hacking group targeting mostly defense uh, contractors, uh, government agencies, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the foreign militaries. Uh, meaning, in this case, the United States, mm -hmm. and they focus mostly on the intelligence uh, gathering as mm -hmm. well as uh, vandalism. Uh, they, uh, for instance, uh, Kim Suk ki was behind uh, hacking into uh, South Korea's hydrogen nuclear power agency, right. mm -hmm. and then they, they stole blueprints for nuclear reactors, for mm -hmm. instance. So, uh, so, it's a, so what Kim Suk ki is doing right now is a classic North Korean hacking activities, mm -hmm. and uh, well, they're trying to gather the uh, information on the ongoing Uchi Freedom Shield exercises.
Right, but in that case, is there any way we can deal with this kind of cyber attacks? So this is behind uh, the recent agreement reached between South Korea and the United States, mm -hmm. the, the strategic framework on cybersecurity cooperation mm -hmm. that, that came out in the, in the aftermath of the, uh, the summit between mm -hmm. President Yoon and the President Biden uh, in April. So this is exactly what we are trying to do. Mm -hmm. Essentially, the, uh, the South Korea and the United States are joining forces mm -hmm. in cyberspace mm -hmm. uh, to detect mm -hmm. uh, uh, this kind of hacking activities by sharing information. Mm. This is very important, sharing information is not just uh, uh, like, a, uh, like a protocol or like a, it's just an activ the nominal activity. It's very important to share information about hacking groups because mm. it's essentially it's like an, any information technology issues. Uh, so by having more information, we can have more information about right. the other side. Mm. So this is the idea that, uh, uh, that uh, we are trying to prevent, mm. not just defend against North Korean attacks, mm -hmm. hacking attacks, mm -hmm. but prevent North Korean hacking attacks by preempting and then uh, forecasting their next move. And so I think uh, uh, the, the fact that the South Korea and the United States are joining forces in cyberspace, as well as in all other domains, are going to act as a deterrence against mm -hmm. North Korean hacking activities. And then in fact, that's exactly what happened this time. Mm. Uh, North Korea had essentially penetrated one of the contractors that are uh, involved in the planning, the, the joint military risk for this year. But then their activities stopped when then uh, their, uh, the North Korean tried to use their, uh, you know, the fact that the computers infected through these activities for with the contractors, and then in turn they tried to hack the, the USFK computers. Mm. That's when the United States uh, stepped in and then uh, shared information with South Korea, and, mm. and then South Korea has been able to uh, deter, I mean, essentially solve this situation. Mm. So this is an instance of uh, South Korea and the United States working together to deter attacks by uh, hacking groups such as Kim Suki. Right, I see. Now, uh, Mr. Huobin, let's also talk about the UNSC meeting. So the UNSC held a rare meeting on North Korea's human rights issues, which was the first open meeting of the 15-member council since 2017. How did it open and what significance did it have? The United Nations Security Council meeting again showed that we're moving towards this blockization of geopolitics. Um, while the subject of human rights abuses was put on the Security Council agenda, both uh, China and the Russian Federation more than ever protested protested against this agenda item. They called it an unnecessary provocation, an escalation, um, and they were really sticking up for uh, DPRK, quite vocally, actually. Now, my pers I, I personally believe that um, Human, the putting human rights on the agenda of, is, of, is of utmost importance, especially the situation in North Korea. The, the, the knowledge needs to get out there. At the same time, um, I'm a free trade politician, and I believe the best way to improve human rights is to facilitate trade amongst nations across the world. And history has shown that where there's free trade, there's interdependence, there's more stability, more economic opportunities, and uh, improved livelihoods for the people, most importantly. And I think in general, if we want to improve human rights, we should move away from confrontation, go back to the policies of uh, late President Kim Dae-jung, for example. We, start, we need to start negotiating about to increase trade, promise the allure of free trade, try to create a level playing field to increase economic prosperity. I mean, in, in my country, we have elections coming up, and I think there will also be elections in South Korea next year in 2024. For the people, these will be pocketbook elections. Both of our countries are still very much dependent on trade and also trade with China. So we as politicians and policymakers, we have to take responsibility. We have to put forward an agenda where, of, of policies where we decrease confrontation, increase free trade, uh, so that our people, as well as the people in other countries, will have a better life. Mm -hmm. Right, I see your point. Now, uh, Dr. Go, we are running out of time, but yeah. I'd like to ask you this last question. So all three countries, South Korea, U.S. and Japan, are going to be members mm -hmm. of the UNSC next year, 2024. Yeah. Uh, how will this further enable them to work together against uh, North Korea? So I think uh, one of the prime uh, areas that uh, the three countries could have some sort of a uh, uh, impact in the ongoing UN activities, uh, especially regarding North Korea, within the field of human rights. Uh, like sanctions, sanctions requires uh, uh, 
uh, resolution by the Security Council, and then China and Russia clearly are exercising bit of power to mm -hmm. protect North Korea. Uh, with the human rights issue, you don't, I mean, you can actually take this issue to the General Assembly, where the simple majority will essentially issue an resolution condemning North Korean activities. And because we know uh, human rights issue, naming and shaming, uh, rather than actual sanctions, can, can have a mo uh, just as a big impact as uh, real sanctions. Mm -hmm. I think that this is a, a prime area where the, the three countries can work together to sway the public opinion, or at least mm -hmm. remind the public, global public opinion of the grave uh, human rights violations that are taking place in the country. Mm, right, I see. Well, unfortunately, this is all the time mm. we have for today's edition. Thank you, Dr. Go, for your My time. My pleasure. And thank you, Mr. Huibin, for your time and insights as well. We really appreciate it. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, that's all for Within the Frame tonight. We'll be back tomorrow with more in-depth stories. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.